Hey everybody, so today we are going to be walking through the thought process that you have to go through when translating models between a labeled property graph, something like Neo Forget or Tiger Graph, and a RDF triple source, something like GraphDB or Stardog. And I'm also going to briefly touch on how does this look in a relational database because just so happens most graph databases allow you to upload data with a CSV file. CSV file looks an awful lot like a table now, doesn't it? Well, that's because at the end of the day, the querying of graph data is one of the most important aspects. You can inherently connect two different nodes because of that relationship. And that modeling is how you get those queries to work correctly. And that's why you can't use, you know, like a cipher query, for instance, on a relational database. However, when you go to store graph data in a relational database, you can do it as long as you have a column for those specific relationships to be stored. So that would look like a node connected to another node. That's how this would look in a regular relational database. And I will put it up on the screen over here. This aspect that I just mentioned was one of the uh, breakthrough moments for me when I was first starting to get into graph because I had previously worked mostly with taxonomies and NLP and things that were still on that relational side of the, of the house. Uh, but I thankfully got to take a fabulous class called uh, Advanced Semantics with uh, Dr. Ed Hovey, who is one of the most brilliant but humble people. Uh, and I remember I, I went to him and I was like, I don't understand how do you get graph to work in a database? Because at the time I only knew relational. And he drew this on a napkin for me. And I know it's a little hard to read here, but it was my turning point into graph, and that's why I've kept this napkin for so long. And that's really what I'm hoping that you get out of this video as well. This video is not meant to solve all of your uh, property graph to RDF needs. There are certainly a lot of nuances. There's a lot of automated tools that also help you with this, but this is a video that I hope just gives you that toe hold into understanding how you can start to deal with graph and model it and how you might be able to implement that with something that you're more familiar with, like a relational database. And the other thing I want to mention is down below, I have a special section, try it yourself, because today I am going to be using a tutorial from TigerGraph to upload a CSV file uh, using a friendship, very small data set and a very simple model. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that same data set and model and transfer it into an RDF model so you can see how that looks. And down below, I also have a tutorial for you uh, that is from this channel where you can walk through how to then use that same model from RDF to upload into GraphDB. Both TigerGraph and GraphDB have free uh, tiers that you can use online so that you can try this out if you want all on your own. I will also have the data sets and the models that I'm working with down below if you wanna try that out as well. All right, so with that, let's go get started. So if you think about how a triple is structured or even you know what you would see in a, a labeled property graph, there's a node, an edge, and a node. Well, that's no different than an ID, a relationship type, and another ID. So let's get into the specifics of this. We're going to be looking at the friendship tables that you can find in the tutorial from TigerGraph. So what you're seeing here on the screen, this is the end graph that you would get from the sample data from TigerGraph. You can see how each node is an individual person, that node has attributes associated with them, and then each edge is basically the relationship between each node. Here's the thing, when you transfer over into RDF, it's going up a few levels. So in RDF, those specific people would be instances. That would be the, the specific person or classes that can have a list of characteristics or a list of instances. So for instance, with 
states. If you have state as a class, you would have instances of all the different states. The class is state, the instances are the different names of the states. Okay, so we are going to look at the data available to us right now in this property graph. So the model is a person has a friendship connection date to another person. Now in a property graph, this data has one very simple relationship between the nodes and that is friendship connection date. So if you look at the model, that's all you need for a property graph. However, when you go to RDF, you have to define a little bit more about all the different attributes that a node might have. And the reason that you do that is because RDF has a lot more expressiveness associated with its, its models and more importantly, the way that it is queried. But for this video, let's just keep it simple with the types of queries that you can do with graph data makes the relationships inherent. Whereas if you're doing this in a regular relational database, you'd actually have to tie together a few different tables to get at the same information. But each of those people have attributes associated with them. Now in a property graph, these are just strings. Now, of course you can still query on those strings, but the difference between the property graph and the RDF is RDF actually defines the different values of those attribute classes. So these classes is really defining what can be associated with a class and the instances or the specific people and the specific names or the specific values that are associated with that class. So this is great from a modeling perspective, but this is where RDF kind of falls short is there's a lot of additional modeling that you have to do in order to make it RDF compliant. And sometimes that turns people off. All right, so looking at this tiger graph data, we can see that there are the relationships between two different people or nodes, and then each of those people have attributes. When you're moving over into RDF, you have to define those attributes as classes so you can understand how they relate to your, your core key or your core nodes in this graph. So in our case, the core nodes or the, the main thing that we're looking at are people and their friendships. So a person's attributes could be, you know, they have an age, they are from a state, they have a gender. Those things are now considered relationships and they have a friendship and a date that that friendship first occurred. Now you need to relate to people in some way. So if you look at what we have up on the screen, so here you can see how you are creating that triple to indicate that a person is from a state. Now let's look at our two models side by side. So you'll see that the property graph is much more simplistic, but the RDF model has a lot more granularity to what it is describing, which is why it's so great for inferencing. However, it has a very distinct drawback, and that is the properties or the relationships themselves cannot have any additional value added to them. So if I was friends with someone for a certain time period, there was no way in traditional RDF for me to express that. However, most linked data on the web is structured as RDF, which is a big reason why a lot of people still use RDF, as well as many other reasons. Check out my video up above if you want to check out more reasons you might consider one or the other. But let's go and jump into how do you populate these models. The specific data as your rows and the columns are going to be your relations. That is how you would take this property graph data after you've modeled it in RDF, which means you have classes and your relations, this is how you get the data into that format. So when you were talking about graph versus relational database, really what you're looking at first, there is a lot more flexibility with graph because those relationships 
or something that you define. You are saying, I care about the relationship between people and which state they're from. Now, why would I care about that as a relation? I can query for all the people that are from California with the data from the property graph or the relational. So when you're populating the data, it actually doesn't look that different than a property graph. The big difference here is there is this overlying ontology that kind of dictates how that specific instance data relates to one another. This is really important when you're doing inferencing and when you're trying to gather a lot of data from external sources because they are all using maybe that standardized format RDF. Whereas with a property graph, it's not as standardized if you want to reuse other people's data. This is a big perk for a graph. Because the relationships add in inherent information, information that we know we really care about, we would normally have to join a few different tables to get this information. But what you might miss if you don't have that inherent uh, explicit relationship is Jenny is a friend of somebody in California, but she herself is not from California. So this is something that may be missed. Now, am I saying that you cannot do this in relational? No, I'm not saying that. But it makes it a lot easier on the querying side if you actually structure your relationships so that you can grab uh, who has friends from California as a complete list. Now, if you did this with graph, that's one query. So you might be asking yourself, okay, well, one query versus two query doesn't seem so bad. But now think of any complex query that you are typically doing and you can see why if you have these highly related kinds of things, you certainly could do join after join after join after join, or you could structure it more like a graph. All right, so there is a lot of nuance to this. There are more exceptions you can certainly get into, but I hope that this was a good first step into how do you understand the difference between getting from a triple store to a property graph and vice versa, and how this actually looks when you put it into a regular database. So if you are interested in more in-depth examples of this, please leave your use cases down below in the comment section, and I will see what I can do to put a video together on that topic. All right, so with that, I wanna thank you very much. I'll catch you next time.